New at 7. One new COVID-19 recovery in Antigua and Barbuda. Confirmed cases remain at 76. Man placed on two years probation for having sex with a 13-year-old girl. Tropical storm Gonzalo barrels toward the Windward Islands. It could become a hurricane by Thursday. And sargassum seaweed causes major challenges for fisher folk. The ABS News at 7 begins now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here on ABS, Antigua's most trusted name in news. My name is Garfield Burford. And I'm Alejandra Robinson. A special welcome to those of you joining us via Facebook Live. Well, we start off this evening with news that another individual has recovered from COVID-19 in Antigua and Barbuda. In the meantime, confirmed cases have remained at 76 as there were no new laboratory confirmed cases. That's right, Alejandra. The latest dashboard from the health ministry shows there are now 50 eight recoveries and 15 active cases. The figures are for information up to 6 p.m. yesterday. Well, the ministry says 39 samples were tested, 13 of which were repeats. Three of the retested samples were positive, while 10 were negative. The other 26 samples also returned negative. A total of 966 people have now been tested. Meanwhile, 34 individuals are in government quarantine facilities, and there are 229 in self-quarantine. Meanwhile, among those in self-quarantine are members of the police force who may have come into contact with one of their colleagues who has tested positive in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Among the officers in quarantine are at least eight fire officers. Dozens of members of the force's band are also in quarantine. As we reported last night, the individual tested positive in St. Vincent and the Grenadines after having tested negative twice in Antigua and Barbuda. We should say that the officer had made several stops en route to St. Vincent and the Grenadines from Antigua. Well, news from the court now, a 21-year-old brigands man has been placed on two years probation for having sexual intercourse with a 13-year-old girl. The defendant, Theodore Horsford, was 19 years old when he committed the offense January last year. The sentence was handed down by Justice Ian Morley in the high court this morning. The child, who had been in company of friends, ended up at Horsford's home on the day of the incident. The defendant, who did not inquire about the girl's age, asked her for sex and she agreed. Well, the child told authorities she'd known the defendant since attending primary school and a judge says he believes the defendant was aware the child was at least below 16 years. He cautions the law puts males on notice for, find out, for finding out the age of potential sex partners, adding it's not acceptable to guess. During a hearing on Monday, senior probation officer Alvin Jarvis testified the child does not appear to have experienced any adverse psychological or deep emotional impact from her sexual contact with the defendant. The child, who was declared a ward of the state, is described as troubled, and the judge, uh, the judge asked social services to redouble their efforts to reach out to her, to support her, and to make her environment safer. Now, Justice Morley assessed the starting point for this case to be in the lowest category, or 3B, of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's sentencing guidelines for the offense. This is calculated as 5% of a life sentence regarded as 30 years, which amounts to 18 months. While the judge then increased this by six months to 24 months since Horsford disregarded the girl's age, the sentence was then reduced by six months back to 18 months since the defendant was of good character and was still a teenager at the time of the offense. A further one-third reduction was applied, bringing the sentence to 12 months in acknowledgement of the defendant's guilty plea. However, the judge later decided to issue a probation order leaning heavily on the evidence that was presented by Probation Officer Jarvis. As part of the order, Horsford must keep the peace for two years or will return to court for sentencing. Reactions this evening after a man succumbed to injuries he sustained when he was electrocuted last month in Buckley's Village. His distraught relatives and former co-workers have been speaking to ABS's Terry Andrew. Work continues here on the Early Childhood Center in Buckley's. 
It was the scene where Claremont Carrington was electrocuted back in June. The wedding is more closer. Our cameras were shown the exact point where the incident occurred. Carrington came in contact with an electric wire while carrying out his duties here as a steel bender. It left Carrington with burns about his body. Doctors and members of his family say he was lucky to have survived. He was airlifted to an Atlanta hospital in the United States, but died on Sunday, July 19. Clarence Gordon was Carrington's supervisor. He normally called us from America. When he was in the hospital, he called us from America. And he looked very healthy and strong on the phone. That he called, did you call? And we stalked him on the phone. Very hard, the guy died. It was a shock to everybody. Nobody expected the guy to die. We expect the guy to be flying and coming back home. Gordon says since the incident, workers have been even more safety conscious. We've been taking precaution because we have a lot of signs up saying that safety comes first. That we don't need any more incidents to happen on this side. His relatives here and in the United States are mourning the loss of the father of three. Kimberly Lewis is Carrington's sister. She recounts the last time she spoke with her brother. We were on the phone with him on Saturday night. We were talking to him. He was saying that he wasn't feeling well. Then she got news. There were complications with his stomach and he had to be rushed to the operating room for surgery. He never made it out alive. She explains his death shook her family. I really expected my brother was to, because he was doing so good. All his burns were healing nicely. They were healing nicely. He was going to come out of the hospital next week. They said they were going to discharge him. I really, really think that I would have seen my brother again. And I, I, I don't know who I'm going to live. I don't know who I'm going to live without him. After the autopsy is completed, Lewis says the family will fly Carrington's body home because she wants to see him one last time. Terry Andrew, ABS News. Thanks so much, Terry. Now, islands in the southern Caribbean are bracing for an impact from Gonzalo at this hour. The system is a major threat to the Windward Islands on its current forecast track. Yes, that's right. It's now a tropical storm and could strengthen into a hurricane within hours. Well, it is the first sign of tropical trouble for the Caribbean in what is already living up to its predictions of an above normal season. Well, joining us early this evening with the latest is meteorologist Lorne Salmon. Lorne, good evening to you. How far away is tropical storm Gonzalo? And at this point, how strong is it? Well, right now we are looking at Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo uh, located just about 1110 miles or so east of the Eastern Caribbean and specifically east of the Southern Wind Windward Islands. Currently we are looking at a tropical storm of winds of about uh, 50 miles per hour and we expect some strengthening of the system over the next 24 hours. So by tomorrow we could very well be looking at a hurricane. Yes, uh, very, very uh, extraordinary news there coming on. Uh, now, based on the forecast track, Lauren, which islands are facing the biggest risk at this point? Well, in terms of the biggest risk, we are actually looking at the Southern Caribbean or the Southern Windward Islands, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. This is the system that we are looking at here. This was the, about the 5 p.m. position of the system, just about 1110 miles or so east of the Southern Windward Islands. And if we just have a look at the forecast track, we can see exactly where the system is expected to track over the next several days and we can see that the islands that are pretty much within that cone of uncertainty are the southern windward islands barbados as well as trinidad and tobago and in terms of the northeastern caribbean we can see that antigua barbuda and leeward islands is still pretty much in a safe zone where this particular uh, tropical storm perhaps a hurricane later is concerned okay so at this point you're saying it looks like those of us in the northeastern part of the Caribbean, Antigua and Barbuda specifically, are outside of that cone of uncertainty. Right, we are very much outside of that cone of uncertainty, but of course the system is still east of us, and although the threat at this point in time is minimal for the northeastern Caribbean, will certainly encourage individuals to continue to be watchful, continue to be vigilant, because this system is expected to become a category one hurricane, and as it becomes more organized, it is very possible 
and, well, let's put it this way. It is not completely out of the question that you could have perhaps a west-northwesterly or even a northwesterly turn. We are hoping that that doesn't happen. However, again, we have to remain vigilant and continue to monitor. Uh, let's go back to that impact. Is there any sort of possibility of rain from the system for Antigua and Barbados? Yes, so, um, most certainly. As the system, and particularly if it develops into a hurricane, if it becomes a little bit broader, so to speak, it is quite possible when it gets into the western or the eastern Caribbean Sea that some of those spiral bands or rain bands associated with the system could very well sweep across us, I would say, by about Sunday, around that time. Hmm. Well, I do notice on your uh, graphic there that mm -hmm. it, you have it as a hurricane, but as it gets into the islands, it seems to be downgraded to a tropical storm. So how strong are you predicting at this point for Gonzalo to be once it gets to the islands? Well, of course, um, you know, the atmosphere at this point in time is quite fluid. Um, things are changing. Right now, as we look at the preliminary information, it is quite possible that when it gets, before it hits the island, it could very well be downgraded to a tropical storm. But of course, a hurricane is not totally out of the picture. Again, the conditions right now are looking quite conducive for further strengthening and further development of the system. So I would say to you that it could either be a hurricane or a tropical storm. I guess that the, the main thing at this point in time is for individuals not necessarily here in Antigua and Barbuda, but across the Southern Caribbean to be prepared for the system. All right, of course, a bit later on, uh, Lorne, you'll join us with uh, even further information on this and possibly an update from the Hurricane Center in relation to the situation with uh, Gonzalo at this point. Thanks so much. We look forward to your every word a bit later on when you have the full weather package. Yes, Thanks. indeed. indeed. Yeah. And Andrew will certainly be keeping across that story very closely indeed. That's right. We'll continue to bring all the details as they become available. Precisely. All right, moving on to another story now, because news emerged yesterday about a virtual party monarch competition to be held next month. Only 10 finalists will be selected to compete virtually in the final round on Emancipation Day and must be accompanied by a band. All of this, of course, be necessary because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has made it impossible for the, for the event to be held in the traditional manner. So what do members of the public think about a virtual competition this year? Here are some of their responses from the streets of St. John's. Honestly, like, I miss going out, so I would more recommend us to go to the ground, but then again, it's only for our safety of what's going on. We should have it, but we should protect ourselves, so let's just do it on our phone. It's good for us. It's going to be quite strange for the artists, but, you know, we have to secure ourselves in this time to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Right now, our economy right now is at a blink, you know? So we have to think more creative and you know, think out the box right now. To get well, totally, it's different because of the virus and everything. Hotels, everybody have a little problem. My job, beach, have a problem. And I feel if this is the way we have to get it, if we really want it, then that's the way we have to get it. I don't think it makes sense because where the fun is if you can't go out in the grounds and have fun. It don't make any sense to just watch it on your TV. Then there's no fun at all. All right, well, ABS continues to bring you must-see television. Tonight on Wadadley Startup, host R. Anderson Edgel speaks with Jacqueline Yearwood, Enterprise Development Director at the Antigua Barbuda Investment Authority. Find out what support, concessions, and government incentives are available for local enterprises. Also, Anderson speaks with Project President of the Barbuda Ocean Club, Justin Wilshire. He will explain how the island stands to benefit, not only from the creation of new employment, but also the facilitation of new local enterprises. Stay with us for what Adley Startup with R. Anderson Edgel coming up at 8 o'clock, right after the evening news. All right, you're in tune with the ABS Evening News. More of those stories for you that we're tracking nationally, regionally, and internationally still to come in this newscast. Well, sargassum takes a major toll on fisher folk. We'll tell you just how that's doing it. And later on during the news from overseas, the Bahamas takes further action in response to a rise in COVID-19 cases. We'll explain what Prime Minister there of the archipelago, Dr. Hubert Minnis, has to say. Stick a, still ahead. Stick with us. Stick with us. Stay with us. At Magico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long.
but after all these years, you just can't let go. At Magico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. With my busy schedule, a CUB debit and credit card is a must. It makes my life much easier. One less thing I have to worry about. Get ready for Carnival Countdown, the virtual edition, every Friday on ABS. Get into the excitement, the fun, the mass, and the bands from our studio to your home. It's Carnival Countdown, the virtual edition, Fridays, 8 p.m., live on ABS. As a new mom, there are moments of pride, joy, and doubt. Yes, doubt. Has he slept enough? Does she have everything that she needs? Will she be okay in the sun? These doubts come from love. For the good of baby, two servings of Nestum are full of all the goodness and naturalness of the cereals that your baby needs to blossom. That's one less thing to worry about. Nestum, it's all good, Mom. Learn more online with Nestle Baby and Me. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying with us. The Sargassum seaweed is not only an eyesore in the nation's turquoise beaches, but also a major concern for fisher folk. ABS's Rakeem Aparisi has sat down with the Deputy Chief Fisheries Officer today, who explains how fishers have so far been affected. If it's floating offshore, it is not an issue, right? It's a free-floating um, algae. It, it occurs naturally in nature. As sargassum seaweed continues to accumulate along the shoreline, concerns are being raised by the fisheries division about the impact the seaweed will have on fishermen plying their trade. They might not be able to access their vessels like they would have. They wouldn't be able to safely navigate through the area to get out to the fishing grounds. And we have issues of fouling of the, the propellers or damage to propellers as a result of sargassum. Deputy Chief Fisheries Officer Trisha Lovell says as the seaweed breaks down, there's also a concern that it will affect electronic equipment aboard fishing vessels. She says the fishermen are also raising concerns about the environmental impact of sargassum. Lovell says in areas where there's a high concentration of sargassum seaweed, there are also low oxygen levels in the water. As the matter breaks down, you create dead zones. So um, you have very anoxic conditions being created in that immediate environment, you have fish dying, lobster dying, um, you have things that might get trapped, so turtles might get trapped or entangled in the, in the sargassum. The influx of sargassum, however, is a double-edged sword. What they have found in, in, in some respects, when it's offshore, when it's free-floating, it actually attracts fish and it attracts a lot of juvenile fish. They've seen it in Barbados. I think we've had um, fishermen reporting the same here. Waves of sargassum seaweed normally originate from the Sargasso Sea in the North Atlantic Ocean. Lovell says this time the seaweed is originating from a different location. And it's actually transatlantic, so it, it's, it's almost like a belt across the southern Atlantic, stretching from um, Brazil to off the coast of Africa. What scientists have been finding is the level of the, the sargassum influx might be dependent on how big that belt of sargassum is in the South Atlantic. Effectively managing the sea, which he says, would require a partnership between the public and private sectors. Rakib Aparicio putting for ABS News. Thanks, Rakib. Meanwhile, we spoke with fisher folk who have provided more details about the challenges caused by the seaweed as they go about getting their catch. Our Terry Andrew visited the Parham Harbor today to get reactions. Sargassum seaweed has been horror for fishermen. One of the main reasons is the corrosive nature of the seaweed. It is causing damage to the engine and the vessels. This drives up operational costs. Evanson Ellis has been fishing for about 20 years. He says the algae is a nuisance. When you're going out to sea, you have to stop two, three times in the harbor alone. That the engine will overheat when the engine pick up the seaweed. So it is, it's a little fight, stop and go, stop and go. If you have to go real far, you need to make much sense. Because if you want to stop and go, you burn a lot of fuel. 
Ellis says they are still catching fish, but in some areas, they have to be patient. Sometimes the weed will fall on the fish spot and all on the weed, so the fish will move to a better area when the feet come down on the bottom, when the weed come down. So sometimes it's a little quiet. You have to work more, swim more. An invasion of the saga, some smother seagrasses and coral reefs, and most time, float on the surface. Out in the deep, I may say deep, like 40 to 90 feet, you can see the weed on the bottom. Well, you come like a whole cloud cover sometimes, even when you're diving and the weed go over your head, you can't see nothing underneath. So it's very scary sometimes. Plus, you have to try to keep the boat away. Sometimes we're diving here and the boat is still a distance away from us because of the weed. So it's a little challenge sometimes. While the fish are still coming in, which means fishermen are still at work, the unwelcome visit of the seaweed presents another challenge to be overcome. Terry Andrew, ABS News. Now, meanwhile, the Fisheries Division is reminding fishermen that the closed season for parrotfish and queen conch are currently in effect. Deputy Chief Fisheries Officer Tricia Lovell says her division is still receiving reports of infractions. What we've seen in, the, in a number of the instances, the persons would have a sign that says they have conch, but it's a permanent sign, so it's like a chalkboard and they paint on it. So on, in those occasions, we ask them to cover the conch. Well, once an entity is found to be in violation of fishing regulations, the seafood is confiscated. We have what we call a three-strike system currently. So um, on the first occasion, the charges would be X. On the second, it would increase. And on the third, generally speaking, if you have three infractions in a row, we would take you to court. The closed season for parrot fish ends on the 31st of July and for Queen Conch, August 31st. Antiguan Barbuda is now mourning the loss of a titan in the medical field. According to reports reaching our news from well-known family physician, Dr. Evans Moulin died late yesterday afternoon. From his practice on New Street and Cross Street in the Ovals area, he was able to cater to the medical needs of many Antiguans and Barbudans from all walks of life. Dr. Moulin also paved the way for scores of Antiguans and Barbudans to acquire higher learning from tertiary level institutions in the Republic of Cuba. In 1980, he was among three outstanding Antiguans and Barbudans who left this country to pursue studies there. Their scholarships were sponsored by the Antigua Caribbean Liberation Movement, or the ACLM, which was led at the time by the late Leonard Tim Hector. Now, the other two scholarship winners were the late George Goodwin and Dr. Radcliffe Robbins. ABS will bring you more on the sad loss of an important contributor in this nation's development. Well, Governor General Sir Rodney Williams is paying tribute to the late Dame Idris Bird as a pioneer in the field of education and culture. Sir Rodney used a media statement today to shower glowing tributes about the various initiatives she pursued in the development of the nation and the profound impact on the lives of many Antiguans and Barbudans. These include the establishment of the Sir Luther Winter, Winter Preschool, Adult Literacy, and her work at the extramural department of the University of the West Indies, where she served as resident tutor. Sir Rodney says Dame Idris loved her country deeply and noted her passion for preserving and promoting the unique features of our culture. According to Sir Rodney, she was a devoted wife and mother and a role model for all citizens. Motorists, uh, bear in mind this story. Stapleton Lane will be closed on the weekend to facilitate ongoing road infrastructure rehabilitation work on Friars Hill Road. As a result of this road closure, there will be one-way access to Stapleton Lane from the roundabout at Old Palm Road. The junction of Stapleton Lane and Friars Hill Road will be closed from 7 a.m. Saturday, the 25th of July, to 6 p.m. Sunday, July 26. Now, police will provide traffic management and implement entry and exit from the roundabout on Old Palm Road to accommodate access to Stapleton Lane. All right, so now, motorists, you're up to date on all that's happening on Friars Hill Road in terms of the roadworks. Indeed, so please. Make sure you're aware and please exercise caution on the streets. Indeed. When we come back from this break, we'll turn our attention to news overseas. First, we'll tell you about news from the region. The Bahamas grapples with rising COVID-19 cases. Another lockdown announced in Grand Bahama. And Father Field, the number of COVID-19 cases around the world reaches another grim milestone. We'll give you those figures when we return. Stay with us.